Good morning. How are you doing? So how's 2024 going? Better than you anticipated so far? Oh, yeah. I hope so. Um, we make it good. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going through the book of Jonah again. I, I, I go through this book with you guys probably every three years or four years or something like that because I think it's just an amazing story. And I, I think it's a, a, a strange story for sure, but it's a strange story for strange times like we live in. Okay. And, and it's an ancient story, but it nevertheless has. It speaks with remarkable clarity um, to a lot of the issues that we face in our modern modern world. I mean, we're just nothing but a bunch of cavemen dressed up in spacesuits. Okay, that's who we are. People are people. People have always been the same. Okay, and and uh, you know, and and in our modern modern world, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of hatred. Have you noticed that? If you watch the news, you read the paper, you see it. Okay, and and uh, but that's nothing new. Okay, it's nothing new. And and. Uh, Jonah's hatreds are central to this story, actually, and, and it, it's, it's really what makes the story go. And, and, uh, and, and so what happened is Jonah was a guy that actually was filled with a lot of hatreds, and, 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 um, and God decided to make Jonah his prophet anyway, okay? And, and, uh, and, 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 to, and he wanted to use Jonah to heal the divisions and the hatreds that were in the ancient world. And, and uh, um, now the job of a prophet, just to kind of review, is to do and say whatever God tells them to do and say, he or she, okay? That's the job of a prophet. And God had a particular assignment in mind for Jonah. Jonah was commissioned by God to speak a message of repentance to a group of people that Jonah hated, the Assyrians, okay? And, and uh, Jonah was commissioned to do this and, 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 and he hated, the, and he actually had good reason to not like the Assyrians, okay? Um, they were constant, he was from what was called the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and they were constantly harassing the Northern Kingdom, and, and, the, and the way they conducted themselves when they do that was absolutely despicable. So he had real legitimate reasons, but God had this particular assignment in mind for Jonah, and here's the thing, Jonah didn't want to do it. Sometimes it's like that, right, in life. You know you're supposed to do something, right? Are there any children in the room? No, they're upstairs, but, you know. And, and uh, we know we're supposed to do something sometimes. We know we're supposed to forgive. And sometimes, what? We don't want to, right? You know, and, and he, he says we're supposed to be generous with other people and give them our time and attention and even sometimes our treasure and, and, and we ignore the idea. We push it away, you know, and, and uh, God says, help, help somebody. Well, you know, I'm too busy, you know, and, and we come up with reasons why we don't do what, we, what we're told to do. And, and God knew that Jonah wasn't going to want to do this. Okay, and that's part of the reason he gave him the assignment. And, and, uh, um, but God told Jonah to get up and go. He was supposed to go to the great city of Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, this, this, this wicked group of people. Okay, and, and, and God told Jonah to say to the Ninevites, you know, you guys better reform yourselves or you're going to be in trouble. There's going to be something really bad that's going to happen to you if you don't get it turned around. And... But because Jonah hated them so much, because we looked at this last week, because Jonah knew that if he fulfilled his assignment, there was a chance the Ninevites would turn it around, and then they wouldn't get the punishment that they deserved. And so he didn't want to go because there might, there might be a chance that they might not get what they so richly deserved in his mind. Okay, So Jonah got up. He refused to go to Nineveh, okay? He said there was no way, no way he was going to do what he was supposed to do. There was no way he was going to say what he was supposed to say. And Jonah was a naughty prophet. <laughs> that's, that's just a good summary of who he was, okay? And, well, how naughty was he? Okay, well, Nineveh would have been a trip to the east into what is now modern-day Iraq, okay? And it would have been a road trip. So when Jonah doesn't said, he goes the opposite direction. He goes to the west to ditch God and to ditch the assignment. Okay, he was going to go on a ship to get as far away as that, from that assignment as he could. And, and here's a summary. I'm going to give you a summary of the beginning 
of the book of Jonah. God says go. Repeat that with me. Go. go. Jonah says no. no. Okay. God says blow. blow. And a big storm came. Okay. And then prophets, God's prophet we're going to see says so. <laughs> he goes to sleep down in the bottom of the hole of the ship. And the, then the pagan ship captain comes to him and he says, bro, what are you doing? Okay, what's wrong with you? So go, no, blow, so, bro. That's the beginning of the book of Jonah, okay? God says go. The Lord gave this message to Jonah. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Jonah says no. But God got up, and Jonah got up, I mean, went in the opposite direction uh, went to get away from the Lord, and he went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish, and he bought a ticket, and he went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish, which was the end of the known world at that time. God says, blow! But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw cargo overboard to lighten the ship. God's prophet says, so. All this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the, the bottom of the ship, okay? And the pagan ship captain says, bro! What are you doing? He went down after him. He said, how can you sleep at a time like this? And he shouted, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and save our lives. And then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. That's the first seven verses of the book of Jonah. Now, there are a number of things in here that I think are super interesting in this passage worth pointing out. God's prophet, okay, is completely clueless and out of touch. He's clueless and out of touch with all the danger that they're facing, right? You know, and while the sailors, what are they? They're totally tuned in, entirely aware of what's going on. They're engaging it. They're trying to do something about it. And Jonah seems to be having some kind of pity party down in the, in the bottom of the ship, selfishly focused on his own problems, while the sailors are doing everything they can for the common good of everybody on the boat. They're working together to try to be saved. Everyone on the ship is frantically praying to their own gods. It's all they know. And they're calling to each other to pray, okay? And then the prophet of God, he's not praying. He's sleeping, okay? And the sailors seem to be acutely aware that there is something unusual about the way the storm arose, okay? Because there was, that there was something deeper going on, so much so that they conclude that there's a source of their, of the, maybe a supernatural source to their peril, and they, so they concluded that it must be like bad karma or something like that. There must be somebody on board this ship that's done something terribly wrong to create this problem that everybody was facing, okay? And by the way, we're going to see that these unbelieving, okay, the, these sailors that believed in their own gods but didn't believe in the true God, okay, they're more open to praying to the true God than Jonah is. We're going to find that out in the story, okay? After all, he's trying to avoid God, right? I think Jonah must have actually been from Northern Europe, okay, because he's actually giving God the silent treatment, <laughs> right? You know, Jonah doesn't want to talk to God. He does it. He's doing everything he can to get away from God. This is a crazy story, you guys. This is not typical prophet-type behavior, okay? A prophet is supposed to be a mouthpiece for God, a representative of the true God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, okay? Being a prophet was, if you look at the prophets, it was a super tough job sometimes. It usually involved giving unwanted messages to a group of people who didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. And so they blamed the prophets. And they were, they were usually unpopular. They were often hated. And sometimes they were emotionally and physically abused. Okay? Sometimes even jailed and beaten. Okay? And the main job of a prophet, nevertheless, was to be faithful to do whatever God said and to say 
whatever it was that God wanted them to say. After all, they're getting their orders from the one who spun up the place, right? And, and, and uh, so God had given uh, the prophet Jonah an unambiguous message. It was very clear what he was supposed to do. And, but because of his disdain for the Ninevites, he refused. And think of it this way. The practical result of him not doing his job, his God-given assignment, okay, was 360 degrees of trouble for everybody, okay, for everybody. When we fail to do this, our assignment, it causes trouble for everybody. After all, these people were in the same boat. Yeah. Right? Yes. Literally, okay? And, 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 and this person of faith doesn't show any sign of caring about his shipmates, okay? The people he's with. And, and so Jonah runs away from God, and God doesn't run away from Jonah. Okay? This is a much about trying to save Jonah is it's trying to save some other people. Instead, God says, blow, right? He sends a storm into the, into the thing to try to get Jonah back in compliance with what he had asked him to do. And you know, sometimes I think God still does that to us today. You know, sometimes we, we, we bring on the trouble ourselves. And, but, but rightly understood from a perspective of faith, even when we're, we're, we're not in a good place, okay? It's meant to get us again realizing who we're dependent upon and how we should be living, you know, and, and get ourselves straightened out. Now, I think there's a couple of important takeaways, you know, from what happened here. First is this, I'm gonna talk about this for a bit. Non-believers, I think, okay, have a right sometimes to evaluate people of faith based on their commitment to seek the good of all people. Does that make sense to you? Okay, one of the things we're supposed to do is seek the good, the welfare of everyone. And, and, and Jonah, this person of faith, doesn't show any sign of, of caring for his shipmates. After all, he was the one that brought the trouble on, right? You know, and, and uh, the Lord hurled this powerful storm. He said, blow, because of Jonah. And these guys feared for their lives. And the desperate sailors were, were shouting out to the, the gods that they knew. And they were telling each other to do the same thing. And, 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 and all the while, Jonah's asleep down in the bottom of the boat. So the captain comes to him and says, bro, what are you doing? Don't you care about what's going on? Don't you care? You need to pray. And it's weird because the captain is using some of the same words that the Lord had spoken to Jonah, right? You know, the, the, at the beginning, God had ordered Jonah to get up and go, okay, to call the Ninevites to repentance. And now you find the sleeping prophet being woken up by the captain, and the captain orders Jonah, get up and call out to your God. You know, I mean, the very words of God are coming out of the pagan captain's mouth. You know, and, and to the prophet. The prophet was supposed to point the pagans to God. Right? And instead, it's a pagan pointing out to the prophet, directing him to his God. And weird, weird story. And, and, and throughout this whole scene, you've got to give them credit. These, this, these unbelievers, you'd say, are acting in commendable ways, right? I mean, they really are. You know, they, they're, they're concerned about each other, right? They're concerned about, you know, did somebody do something wrong? They're concerned about human sin. Missing the mark, you know, and, and they're using all their skill, everything they know to try to solve their problem. They're praying, they're throwing stuff overboard, doing all this stuff. They're seeking God for help. They're seeking divine guidance. And, and it says this, in verse 7, it says the crew cast lots to see which of them offended the gods and caused a terrible storm. And when they did this, however this worked, the lot fell on Jonah. They found out that Jonah was the cause. He was the one, okay, this prophet of God. And, and, and so it, it was revealed to them that Jonah was the prophet, that because of his sin, they were in deep trouble, and they were maybe going to go down to the deep, deep bottom of the sea as a result of it. And, 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 uh, and so they confront Jonah, and they pepper him 
with questions. This is what it says in verse 8. It says, why has this awful storm came upon us? What, Jonah, what's going on here? You know, who are you? What's your line of work? What country are you from? What's your nationality? Tell us about yourself. And here's the thing. All this while, Jonah knew it was his fault. Right? right. He knew. And, and, and he was the guilty one. And he shows no sign of showing remorse personally or for the trouble he's causing other people. Right? You know, and, and, and finally, so now he's unable to hide it. And so he fesses up. And this is what he says. He says, I'm a Hebrew. Okay? And the name of my God is Yahweh. Okay? And oh, by the way, he's the God of heaven. And he's the one that made the land and the sea. And they're all, oh, the sea? He's the God of the sea? He's the God of everything? He's the one who made it? And it says that the sailors were terrified when they heard this. And he had already told them when they were just talking up on the ship before the storm came that he was running away from Yahweh, his God. <laughs> now you got to understand that back in this day, and this may show Jonah's deficiency in his understandings because there was an idea in the ancient times that gods have, had localized kind of jurisdictions. Okay? And so he may have not really comprehended fully what was going on, who, who this, this true God, the one who made everything, was. And he thought he could run away from them. Sometimes we try to run away, and maybe we're just as foolish. I don't know. You know but, and then, they, then it says this, and then they groaned. Oh, why did you do it? Why did you do this, Jonah? You know, again, and here's the thing, too. Think about this. These unbelievers outshine this believer almost at every turn, okay? So now they know it was him, okay? And, and, and they're trying to get out of their problems, so they seek understanding, right? And, and they, they seek answers, and then when they find out it's him, they just go, dude, bro, why did you do it? Why? They don't, they don't yell at him. They don't speak words of hate towards him, right? They don't, they don't rough him up. And they don't kill him for what he did. And, and at every turn, these unbelieving sailors behave with more dignity and basic human decency than this prophet. Okay? And, and these, these unbelievers, it would be a good time to silence your phone. <laughs> don't worry about it. And, and um, the unbelievers in this story outshine the prophet almost at every turn. And, and on the surface, that's kind of shocking, right? You know, and, and, and uh, I mean, how can someone who claims to worship the God of heaven and earth and the one who made the sea and the land show such indifference, such callousness towards, you know, fear that they've caused, the suffering that they've caused, you know? How can they be traveling such a low moral road, you know, and compared to the unbelievers that are around them? And so the first takeaway from the story, from the beginning of the story, is that non-believers, these guys are like, dude, what have you done? You know, it's, and what's unspoken is, if you're the worshiper of the true God, the God of the sea, okay, like, we hold you to a higher standard, man. I mean, we're all in the same boat together. We need you, right? You know, and, and, and the captain rightly judged him. He said, we're all out here praying for the common good. We, we care about what's going on. And don't you care that we're in peril? You know, don't, don't, what's wrong with you? You know, get on your knees, man. Get on your knees. And, and there's nothing in the text that indicates that Jonah actually got on his knees. It doesn't say that. Maybe he did, but it's not shown in the text. And, and, and Jonah failed to bring the resources of his faith to bear on the trouble that was going on on the ship. And so the captain rightly criticized him and, and for failing you know, to live out his stated faith. And, and, uh, and then Jonah, he told the sailors, I'm a Hebrew, I worship Yahweh, the, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. And the sailors were terrified because and, and, he already told them that. They groaned, why didn't you do it? Why did, I mean, why did you do it? You know, and, and, 
and, and we're, we're in a storm on the sea and you say you worship the God, you know, who's the, the God of the sea. Why did you disobey him? Why did you bring so much trouble into our lives? You know, we're not going to maybe see our families again, you know, because of you. And, and why did you do it? It's a fair question. Amen? You know, and, and uh, you know, it was true then, it's true today. You know, the, um, you know, you guys, you guys know me, you know, I'm patriotic. I'm, I'm now, I hit 25 years with the Sheriff's Department, and I'm the lead chaplain for the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. And, and, and I'm, I'm down with all that, okay? But here's the thing. As Christians, okay, we can never feel self-justified because of the wrongs that we see going on in our world to point fingers and to, to speak words of hatred and disgust to individuals or to groups of people because we, th think we're, we think they're leading us the wrong way. You know, that's not our role, okay? We're never, we're never justified in being spiteful and, and use condescending rhetoric or, or, or denial of basic truths and information and, and, and retaliatory violence and associating with groups that are racially or ethnically, you know, prejudiced. That is not the job of God's people, okay? And, and you, we are the ones who claim to represent the one who out of love came into the world to heal what's wrong in our world. And we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives to the world. And it's our job to get that message right and to care about our shipmates, to care about what's going on in the world and to bring God's eternal fix to bear and believe that without love, we are nothing. And without love, we can accomplish nothing. Amen? Amen. That's our job. It's not always easy, okay? But that is our job. So Jonah deserved the criticism of the pagan captain. He deserved the disappointment of the sailors. And, 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 and so do we if we fail to bring the resources of our faith to bear to help the, and, and create betterment. For, for our communities and the people around us. And, and, and the second takeaway is this. Uh, believers should respect and learn from the wisdom and sometimes the moral virtues of those that don't believe. Okay? Okay? If, I've already said the, the unbelievers in the story outshine the believer, okay, at every turn. And, and it was true then, it's true now. You know, and, it's, and you know, it's, it's unbelievers sometimes outshine us. You know? And they, they do sometimes, you know. They, their insistence to work for the common good and for their fellow human beings, okay? There's a theologian named Phyllis Tribble that said this about Jonah's story. She said this. In this episode, this is a passage we just read, that hope, justice, and integrity reside not with Jonah, okay, but with the captain and the sailors. And, and though blameless victims, the sailors never cry injustice, finding themselves in a dangerous situation, not of their making, they seek to solve it for the good of all. Never do they wallow in self-pity, great and angry God, condemn an arbitrary world, target the culprit Jonah for vengeance or promote violence as an answer. They're working towards the common good. And, and there's, a, there's a theological idea, and it's called common grace. Okay? It's, a, it's a theological term. Okay? And, and, and what it means is that one theologian put it this way, the doctrine of common grace is the teaching that God bestows gifts of wisdom, moral insight, and goodness, and beauty across humanity. Everybody's capable of those types of things. And, and as marred and, and as imperfectly as we express it sometimes, and regardless of race, religion, whatever, okay? It's the idea that ultimately the one who gives both believers and unbelievers life also gives them the ability to sometimes conduct themselves with goodness, wisdom, and justice. And, and, and we're capable, all, of, all people, if they choose to, are capable of making the world a better and more tolerable place. That's just true, okay? That's called common grace. And, 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 and we've got to give it to the pagan captain. You've got to give it to the pagan sailors. You know, they, they get it right when God's person doesn't get it right. And, and, and in fact, centuries later, after, this, after these events, Jesus reinforced this point in a story that he told. And, and I want to tell it to you kind of quickly. The story came in a setup. It's recorded in Luke 10. 
And one day this expert in the religious law came to Jesus and, and, and he wanted to test Jesus. He said, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus gets the guy to answer the first question himself. He says, he, he says what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Okay, what do you think? And he, the man said, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, right, right. go do that, go do that. But, you know, evidently, he, the guy's going to do a follow-up question now, because evidently the guy, you know, there were some people, kind of like Jonah, kind of like us sometimes, people that he didn't like, okay? And so, so the guy asks his follow-up question, well, who's my neighbor? Who am I supposed to show this love to? And uh, I'm supposed to love God, and then I'm supposed to bring this out into this, this horizontal direction. Who, is the, who are the people that are deserving of this love? And, 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 um, and so the man wanted, it says in the text, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who am I required to love? And, 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 and um, I like the Living Bible's translation because it really pulls out the meaning of it. It says, the man wanted to justify his lack of love for certain kinds of people, for some people. And, and so he said, which neighbors? Which neighbors? And, and, and Jesus tells him a story in it as, an, as the answer because this guy can't get this one on his own. And, and so... And it exposes a lot of stuff. It cuts through you know, attitudes of superiority. It cuts through self-justifying our hatreds and, and all this kind of stuff. And the hero in the story is someone who was, by Jews, universally despised, okay? Someone called a Samaritan, okay? Jews would purposely not travel to the area that they lived in because they just hated them. They didn't like them. They looked at, looked at them kind of like spiritual and racial half-breeds. And, 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 and they just really were looked down upon. And, 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 and Jesus turns the table on this guy, and he's going to tell a story that shows that the Samaritan is the one who really gets it, who really understands what God's requirement is to, of loving the neighbor. It's the Samaritan who shows what loving your neighbor actually looks like in the real world. And, 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 um, and it's, he, so he tells a story. He says, in answer to this, who is my neighbor? A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up. They left him half dead beside the road. And, and by chance, a priest came along, religious leader. And, and when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side. Didn't want to get involved. Kept going. And, and the temple assistant, walked beside somebody that helped him out, the priest out, worked in the, in, in the temple, walked over, and he, he was a little braver. He came and looked at him, and I don't want to get involved. And he, and he kept going. And, and, uh, and then it says a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion on him. And he went over to the man, and the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey, he got him in his car, and he, and he took him to a, a hotel, an inn, and, and where he took care of him. Where he took care of him. He didn't just give him a room, pay for the room. He spent the night with the guy, nursing him back to health. And, and the next day, the guy wasn't still prepared to go. His injuries were too, too bad. And so that he handed the innkeeper a couple of silver coins and he, and he said, take care of this guy, and if his bill runs higher than this, the next time I'm through this area, I'll make it right with you. And, the, and the, the innkeeper seemed to understand that this was a man of his word, and so he did it. He took, he took the money, said he would take care of him. That's who your neighbor is, okay? And that's where we, what we can learn from, from the world. Guys, the reality for all of us is this, and I'm at the front of this line. There's certain people, there's certain situations you get yourself into where you go, you know what? No. There's certain situations, there's certain people where you go, look at them. Look at them. There's certain times in our life where we say, God, it's them. They're the problem. And God always says, hey, calm down. Remember how you get into this place. How do you get into the kingdom? It's me, Lord. I'm the problem. 
I'm the one that has to bow the knee at the cross. I'm the one that has to humble myself and realize that I'm the one that needs forgiveness. I'm the one. It's me. It's a it's me movement that Jesus came to start in this world. And, and, and when people will bow the knee and say, it's me, and never forget where they came from. That's the, that's the important part. Never forget where we came from. Then you know what will happen? The young people in our world will look to the church and they'll go, that's a place of hope. That's a place where love gets expressed. That's a place that serves the world, no matter who they are. It's a place of acceptance. It's a place of compassion. It's a place of truth. And it's a place of service. I want to be involved in that. And the movement will continue. Let's pray together. Father, you tell us to go. You tell us to go. Help us not to say no. By trying to ditch you or ditch the assignment. Lord, use us to better the lives of everyone, not just some. We thank you for the privilege of being your people on the spot, being the ones that you want to use in this world, in this crazy sometimes, mixed up world with people who who, who don't know you, who are far from you, are very confused in their thinking sometimes, make us the ones who lovingly accept, show compassion, and within that context speak truth and serve. Make us your people in this world. It's in your name we pray. Amen.